Good afternoon, Good everyone, and thank you for being here with us. We are the risk among us, and today the members of the team, Dave, Christine, and I, were here to share with you the story of the currency derivative scandal that occurred in the National Australia Bank. On the next slides, this is today's agenda, and we will go through each of the sections in further detail, which I'll begin by introducing the background. So the story begins in 1999, where the internal audits of the National Australia Bank started to raise concern on the lack of proper risk management in the desk of currency options. Even though after a year, new controls were developed and implemented, but it left out many issues previously identified unresolved. Starting in year 2000, the currency desk started to make losses. From the lack of proper controls, the traders begin to exploit the system. They engage in fake transactions to hide the losses and inflate the gains. Over the years, losses kept snowballing. And in early 2004, the accumulated losses were valued around 360 million. Next, Cindy will start introducing the solutions to the problem. Thank you, Julio. So after the scandal, one may ask what went wrong. Although it's natural to blame the involved traders, we believe the real cause was the lack of proper governance. First, the firm had a culture that only focused on good news. So traders would want to use fraudulent transactions to smooth out trades and cover the losses. And senior management cannot see the real exposures. Secondly, the firm lacked controls to prevent such issues and disregarded warning signs as they merged. Lastly, the models were flawed and even took incorrect inputs. Our proposed solution and the general approach include establishing a governance framework guided through the right tone from the top and utilizing the three lines of defense to, provide, uh, to divide employee responsibility through an integrated risk model, along with up-to-date technologies to reduce the operational risks. The controls introduced are ranked by the following criteria. Feasibility, how easy it is to implement, the cost, and the timeliness, which is how long it takes for the control to be effective. To establish an effective risk governance framework, we start from the three lines of defense, which is a framework that divide up the risk management duties to three groups of employees. They are independent and have their own responsibilities, which we'll further discuss. Each line of defense must follow an integrated risk management process where they will start with identifying problems, developing controls, assessing them, then communicating and reporting problems to the senior level. Continuing to monitor, incorporating new technologies where applicable, this framework allows the bank to develop a risk-aware culture which helps to improve their decision-making process. Next, I'll introduce the controls that the bank should have in place using the three lines of defense and rank from the most important to the least important. Starting with the first line of defense, it consists of traders and operating managers at the trading floor. They should be responsible to manage their risk exposures and to keep them below their risk limits. The relevant controls include First, maintaining a well-functioning system that consists of periodic system updates that would fix the one-hour trading problem, a, a cloud platform to backup transactions, a detailed risk management dashboard to monitor the risks that traders are taking each day, and an appropriate access entitlement system that would ban traders from accessing the transaction records in order to prevent data manipulation. Secondly, the bank should have in place risk limitations, such as imposing quantity limits to put upper bounds on transaction sizes to prevent traders from taking excessive risks, and use stop-loss orders to prevent values of transactions falling outside of their risk appetite. Thirdly, the compensation structure should also be modified to prevent principal agency problems. For instance, they could tie the bonus payments with the amount of risk each trader takes and use clawback provisions which pay the bonus over a long term to discourage traders from engaging in risky positions that would pose long-term issues. In the end, employee ethical training is also crucial for creating a good company culture, and the bank should also provide a confidential whistleblower hotline to encourage employees to report any unethical behavior. Moving on to the second line of defense, it is, presented, it is represented by the Risk Management and Compliance Division, whose responsibility is to oversee risk and to monitor the effectiveness of risk management practices done by the first line of defense. 
The relevant controls include: first, the risk managers should monitor the consistency of transaction records to ensure data integrity and conduct flash checks to catch misconducts in a timely manner. In addition, the bank should revisit their models to identify issues, which includes both verifying the model is properly used and ensuring the model assumptions are met. They should also regularly perform model vetting to check for the model's validity. Lastly, limit breaches must be investigated thoroughly as it occurs, so that they could tackle suspicious activities in a timely manner. They should also consider delegating authority to appropriate individuals to avoid the problem of confusion in duties. Now moving on to the third line of defense, it is comprised of internal audit division, who provides highly independent and objective evaluations of the overall risk management effectiveness of the bank, including how strong are the first and second line of defense. Some essential tasks that they should perform include: first, regularly review the risk models and to ensure that the models is properly validated and implemented to reflect the ongoing changing environment. Secondly, conduct flash checks to assess whether the first and second line of defense are fulfilling their responsibilities, and to ensure that investigations are properly tackled. Lastly, the internal audit division should establish a panel of compliance. This invites outside experts to participate on the panel, and thus promotes initiatives to further ensure the bank's compliance with the current set of regulations. With a complete three lines of defense framework. The NAB would have been more transparent, which reduces the likelihood and impact of misconduct, such as fraudulent transactions and smoothing activities. Next, Chris will talk about the problems with smoothing practices. Thank you, Cindy. So, smoothing refers to traders shifting their profits and losses from one day or one period to another, because traders prefer consistent trends in reporting their profits and losses over inconsistent surprises. Smoothing would help them achieve target profit. And potentially receive more bonus payments. Smoothing is hard to detect without a robust risk governance framework, and may only has little impact in a short run. However, empirical evidence shows if smoothing activities become an accepted practice, it would cause dramatic impact from both business and risk management perspective in the long term. Firstly, from a business perspective, smoothing would lead to concealment in financial reports. It reduces the fluctuations in profit and losses to portray a steady performance, which eventually makes an AB not able to detect the risk hidden in the daily business operations. Secondly, smoothing can create a ripple effect among traders. This misconduct may start with only one trader, but when other traders see the benefit of smoothing, they may start doing the same and make smoothing become an accepted practice over time. Thirdly, smoothing is prohibited by the banking regulators. So it could、uh, cause NAB fail to comply with the、uh, regulatory requirements and result in penalty fines or even sanctioning. Lastly, once the smoothing practice is exposed to the public, it would cause tremendous damage to NAB's trustworthiness and credibility to many stakeholders. It may it may further lead to a dramatic decline in the stock price because firms are especially vulnerable to anything that damages their reputation. Next, I will explain from a risk management perspective. So, if smoothing activity become a common practice, it would impede the risk management team to properly manage the risk exposures. First reason is that smoothing will create an illusion of low fluctuation in the trading performance, which would mislead the risk management team into believing that traders are generating consistent profit by current trading strategy. Thereby, risk managers will be overlooking their potential risk exposures. Second reason is that smoothing would cause those risk metrics not able to reflect the true business condition. For example, VARs and expected shortfalls are commonly estimated based on past data. As smoothing reduces historical fluctuation, those risk metrics are unlikely to be realistic. In addition, smoothing would result in a reliable sensitivity analysis, because the Greek measures calculated from the false transactions are unlikely to be correct, which would cause the perceived risk position of the currency portfolio to be inaccurate. And potentially lead to insufficient risk exposure adjustment for hedging purpose. Lastly, smoothing would lead to insufficient capital requirement for NAB's foreign exchange trading line of business, which causes the overall business capital allocation to be undesirable. Smoothing activities prevent NAB allocating enough cash to the reserve, puts the bank in a very risky position, and allows the resilience towards potential disruptions. 
So we'll explain more in detail on how smoothing impacts firms' capital requirements later. So overall, smoothing would cause risk management team unable to identify risk since, since risk overlooking, not able to measure or assess risk because of inaccurate risk metrics and the sensitivity measures, and also hard to manage risk because of insufficient capital requirements. So definitely, so smoothing activities is an improper practice, both from business and the risk management perspective. Now I'll pass on to Julio. He will talk about how smoothing activities impact on capital requirements. Thank you, Chris. So when the scandal is uncovered, the regulators will have demanded National Australia Bank to hold additional capital. Back in 2004, as a leading bank in Australia, the bank will have transitioned from Basel Bank into Basel II. Thus, we chose Basel II as a framework to assess the capital impact from smoothing practices. In Basel II, the capital requirements is broken down into three main components, credit, market, and operational risk. The credit risk capital was calculated under the IRB approach. The model includes estimates for probability of default, loss given default, and exposure at default. To smooth out the profits, the traders had recorded multiple fake transactions and more transactions increase the estimates for the exposures, ultimately inflating the estimates of exposure at default. Thus, NAB will have to hold higher capital for credit risk. Next, the market risk capital, measured by the standardized approach. The model includes three components, the sensitivity component, the default component, and the residual add-on component. Greeks measures including delta and gamma, they are embedded in the sensitivity component. And fake transactions enter from the opposite direction to smooth out the losses would have reduced the estimates for Greeks in the sensitivity, resulting in lower capital requirements for market risk. Lastly, operational risk. Under the advanced measurement approach, the model includes estimates of VAR and expected losses. Hiding the losses reduces both VAR and the expected loss, but especially the VAR, since losses were extremely large. Thus, capital requirements for operational risk will have been much lower. Now the question is, would there be any additional capital penalties once the business returned back to normal? Because of lack of financial data, we solely focus on penalty in operational risk. Under the advanced measurement approach, the bank will have required to post consistent additional capital from the increase in VAR estimates over one year. But what if the scandal was uncovered in recent years? NAB would follow the Basel III, shifting into the new standardized measurement approach. Similarly, more capital would be required due to the impact from the loss component, which I'll be explaining the differences of the two calculations in the next slides. The advanced measurement approach in Basel II, the capital covers the difference between the 99.9% VAR and the expected loss. This approach combines a variety of risk exposures from the firm. So for simplicity, we assume that the VAR and expected loss from the trading desk is similar to the overall bank. From the bottom left chart, with smoothing practices, the expected loss would be 8 million with a VAR of 51 million. Once the scandal was uncovered, the new VAR will have increased up to 252 million, which additional 65 million capital had to be held to comply with regulators. Now, on the right, if National Australia Banks follow the new standardized measurement approach from Basel III, this model places greater emphasis in financial books. The components of these models include the business indicators which represents the bank's income. The other component is the loss multiplier, which compares the historical loss to the income earned today. The total loss from smoothing value approximately 360 million. This increase in income in the business indicator. So with smoothing, NAB will earn greater income, which also increases the capital requirements. Surprisingly, the two results are contradicting. This is because the AMA in Basel II, the regulators wanted banks to hold capital for their risk exposure. On the other hand, the new standardized measurement approach focuses on the profit made by banks, which discourage bank profit from risky practices, such as smoothing activities. Next, 
they will introduce the dashboard that we have developed. Thank you, Julio. Uh, after we listed the key risk controls and build a robust risk management framework, based on that, we developed two dashboards, options and operational risk management dashboard. First, let's talk about options dashboard. This dashboard generates some key risk metrics that can directly give risk management manager a rough idea about the extent of risk in the currency option trading desk. On the top of the dashboard, we generate VAR and stress VAR based on the past 250 days data and list, the, and list them as line charts with their dollar amounts in the table, following other sensitivity analysis and Greek letters for all currencies. Sensitivity analysis measures the portfolio value change from the percentage increase or decrease. Greek letters are the risk sensitivity metrics, which measures how sensitive the value of currency portfolio. The charts at the bottom are the major counterparties of maybe daily p &L of all currency pairs and trade trend with detailed information for each trader. For the major counterparties, it measures the credit risk that NAB is exposed to. p &L breakdown measures the daily profits and losses for all currency pairs. And trade trend is the line chart tracks the number of trades traders submitted every day. And the table below measures the daily limits of each trader. And next, let's talk about the operational risk management dashboard. This dashboard enables NAB's risk management head to view the complete risk exposure for the currency option trading desk in a single consolidated report to analyze the risk posture efficiently. This dashboard can be separated by this red line. Above are the internal control factors, below are the business environment factors. For the internal control factors, email trend, working hours, and trade trend shows the trading behavior for each trader. And PL tracking and breakdown can generate the, the trading PL from each trader and provide the proportions of profits and losses. Um, and the bonus payment shows the pattern for each trader in past four years. The table below shows the daily detailed information for each trader. For instance, number of trade cancellation, exposure, and limit have struck a lot with explanations. And the second part is business environment factors. You can click this small uh, icon here, and it will show the organization chart for the currency option desk. The market news table summarizes some important quarterly change um, uh, in the external business environment. And the three cards here is the current current model version we are using, a fixed system problem, and the number of system failure in this quarter. Last column charts, regulatory alerts. It matters how many alerts the desk received from the regulator. That's all about our dashboard. And in conclusion, NAB's loss was caused directly by four currency option trading uh, traders entering fraudulent transactions for over two years and covering them with smoothing techniques. However, the root cause of the misbehavior was reinforced by NAB's cultures and surroundings. The robust risk governance framework we built can help NAB delegate and coordinate essential risk management duties. Especially, the three lines of defense model provide a simple and effective way to enhance communication on the risk management and control by clarifying essential roles and duties. The accurate capital requirement could provide NAB enough liquidity if some bad things happen. In addition, the comprehensive risk management dashboard enable NAB risk management team to review and analyze the complete risk posture for currency option trading division. We are confident that our proposed governance framework could be applied to any other bank to maintain a proper effective risk management and prevent similar scandals. Thanks for listening to our presentation and hope you are enjoying it. We are opening to any questions. Excellent. Very well done.